Hi, welcome to the value of muon g minus 2 predicted in the standard model. In the previous videos, what is muon g minus 2, parts 1 and 2, we talked about g minus 2 of the muon. Now there's a new experimental result from the Fermilab muon g minus 2 experiment that is expected to be announced in a seminar on April 7th. You can find a link to that experiment's website in the description below. Now there we're going to learn about the new experimental result, but in order to compare experiment and prediction, we need to understand both of them. So here we give the current, as of March 2021, experimentally measured value of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon and the value predicted by the standard model. And the first thing to notice about these numbers is that they are crazy precise. So in both cases, the error bar is in the last two digits of the value given. So if we look at the difference between the experimentally measured value and the value predicted by the standard model, we find that they differ by 3.7 sigma. Now, the experimentally measured number will be updated very soon. But the standard model prediction will be the topic of this video. Okay, so here we're going to talk about the classes of contributions to muon g minus 2 in the standard model and the uncertainties on the standard model prediction and where they come from. So basically in this video, we're going to be looking at this number and its error bar. This video will be mostly based on this paper by Aoyama et al. This paper is a work of more than 100 authors to recommend a single value for the standard model prediction for g minus 2 of the muon. This paper is also based on many previous works, so please see the references in that paper as well. This video assumes that you've watched the previous videos in the mini-series on G-2 of the muon. If you haven't watched those videos, and if this topic is new to you, we suggest starting at the beginning of the playlist. You can find a link to the playlist above. Okay, so in the previous video, we saw that Dirac originally derived the result g equals 2. But there are corrections to this result. These corrections render g equal to something other than 2. And this means that the anomalous magnetic moment, a mu, which is defined as g minus 2 of the muon over 2, is not equal to 0. Now we saw there that the first correction is the Schwinger term. The contribution of this term gives a mu equals alpha over 2 pi, where alpha is equal to the fine structure constant. Now the Schwinger term is the largest contribution to mu on g minus 2. But getting a high precision result requires including smaller contributions, and sometimes much, much smaller contributions. So let's look at those now. The contributions to mu on g minus 2 are typically broken into three classes. The quantum electrodynamics, or QED corrections, the electroweak corrections, and the hadronic corrections. In order to understand why the contributions are broken into these three classes, let's first take a very quick tour of the standard model. So, in the standard model, we have six quarks, the up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom quarks. And each of those quarks comes in three colors. We also have six leptons, the electron, the muon, which we're mostly interested in here, and the tau, along with their respective neutrinos. Also, each of the quarks and leptons has an antiparticle, which isn't shown here. 
Next we have the gauge bosons. These are the photon, represented by the letter gamma, the Z boson, the W plus and minus bosons, and the gluons. And finally, we have the Higgs boson, represented as an H. So the gauge bosons mediate forces between particles. In the case of quantum electrodynamics, interactions between particles are mediated by the photon, which is massless. The weak nuclear force is mediated by the Z and W plus and minus bosons, which are heavy. And lastly, the strong force is mediated by the gluons. Now the gluon is massless, but it doesn't interact with leptons, including the muon. So to illustrate this, let's say that we have a muon and an electron coming in from the bottom of the page. And they're going to bounce off of each other. But when they do that, they don't interact directly. Instead, they interact by exchanging a photon or a Z boson. Alternatively, if we had a muon and a positron coming in from the bottom of the page, they could exchange a W boson and be converted into a muon neutrino and an electron antineutrino. Okay, so the electroweak gauge bosons, the W and the Z, are much heavier than most other particles that we might be familiar with. So the masses of the Z and the W are much greater than the masses of the muon, the electron, the proton, the neutron. At low energies, diagrams that contain a Z or a W tend to be suppressed. And one way of saying this is the following. The weak nuclear force is weak at low energies because it is mediated by heavy bosons. To illustrate this, we can look back at that diagram we had that had a Z exchange. And we can turn it by 90 degrees to represent a different process. So this diagram represents a process where we have a muon and an anti-muon coming in from the bottom of the page. They annihilate and produce a Z boson, which then in turn disintegrates into an electron and a positron. And in order to understand this diagram, you need to know that we're using a convention that arrows are reversed on antiparticle lines. So you can see that the arrow on the mu plus line and the arrow on the E plus line are going in the opposite direction from what you would expect. At low energies, this process is suppressed. But if the muon and anti-muon collide with a center of mass energy roughly equal to the mass of the Z boson, this diagram becomes very important. A similar effect occurs in diagrams contributing to muon G-2. Diagrams containing heavy particles like the W and Z bosons will be suppressed. Their contributions to muon G-2 will be small. And lastly, the muon can also interact with the Higgs boson. The mass of the Higgs boson is also much greater than the mass of the muon. And also the coupling of the Higgs to the muon is small. So diagrams containing the Higgs are negligible here. Now there is one more gauge boson that is light that we haven't really talked about. That's the gluon. Now the gluon is massless, but it doesn't interact with the muon. Now it does interact with quarks, so it can be relevant for processes that have quarks in them. Interactions between quarks and gluons at low energies are so strong that we don't see free quarks in particle physics experiments. Instead, quarks are bound into states called hadrons. Now, there are a couple of hadrons that are probably familiar to you, the proton and the neutron. But there are also many less familiar hadrons, pions, kaons, and many, many more. 
Okay, so with that, let's look at the classes of contributions to muon g minus 2. Okay, so we said that the first class was corrections due to quantum electrodynamics, or QED. These are diagrams that contain only photons and leptons. These will give the largest contributions to muon g minus 2. Next, we have the electroweak corrections. These are corrections from diagrams that contain W, Z, or Higgs bosons. These will give very small contributions to muon g minus 2. And lastly, we have the hadronic corrections. These are from diagrams containing quarks, or more accurately, hadrons, and photons. These corrections are fairly small, but they do have the largest uncertainty. Okay, so let's start with the QED corrections. These are terms that arise from diagrams containing only leptons and photons. And we already saw one of these, the Schwinger term. Now the QED contribution is the largest contribution to muon g minus 2, which means that for the QED corrections we need a very precise result. So in order to get that, the calculation considers diagrams with up to five loops. So here we can see some example diagrams running from two loops in the upper left-hand corner to five loops in the lower right-hand corner. So there are a couple of important points to be aware of when considering the contributions from diagrams with different numbers of loops. The first is that as you go from a small number of loops to a large number of loops, you get more diagrams. So for the QED corrections, we saw that there was only one one-loop diagram. That's the Schwinger term. But if we go to five loops, there are actually more than 10,000 diagrams that need to be considered. The other important point is that as you go to more loops, the contributions tend to get smaller in size. So if we look at the QED term that comes from the one-loop diagram, from the Schwinger term, the contribution to A mu is of order 10 to the minus 3. On the other hand, if we look at the five-loop contribution, the contribution to A mu is of order 10 to the minus 10. So here's the value that they give for the QED contribution to A mu. It's about 10 to the minus 3, dominated by the Schwinger term, but there are an awful lot of significant digits, and the error bar is in the last three of those digits. Now the largest source of uncertainty is from the omission of diagrams with six or more loops. But other sources of uncertainty include uncertainty on lepton masses, uncertainty on alpha, the fine structure constant, and from numerical integrations. Just as a side note, one of the sources of uncertainty given above is the uncertainty on alpha, the fine structure constant. And the value of alpha that they used was taken from a cesium atom interferometry experiment. But there is also another way to measure alpha, and that's through g minus 2 of the electron. In fact, the experimental value of g minus 2 of the electron is even more precise than that for g minus 2 of the muon. So g minus 2 of the electron, like g minus 2 of the muon, depends on alpha. And so you can take the measured value of g minus 2 of the electron and using some extremely complicated calculations, extract a value of alpha. And the value of alpha that comes out of that is slightly less precise than what you get from the cesium interferometry experiments. Okay, so now on to the electroweak corrections. So this class of contributions to G minus 2 comes from diagrams that contain electroweak gauge bosons. 
the W or the Z, or the Higgs boson H. And these contributions are small because of the large masses of the W, Z, or Higgs. As the electroweak contributions are smaller, it's not necessary to go to such high precision, so the calculation for these terms only goes up to two loops. So here we can see two example diagrams that go into the electroweak corrections. On the left we have a one-loop diagram, and on the right we have a two-loop diagram. So here's the result for the electroweak contribution to A mu. The main thing to notice about this number is that it is way, way smaller than the QED corrections. Okay, so now on to the hadronic corrections. So in the section on QED corrections, we didn't mention any diagrams that contained quarks. And we can certainly draw diagrams that have quark loops in them. But when the quark momenta are small, the interaction between quarks and gluons becomes strong, and the quarks are bound into hadrons. This means that the calculations break down, and more specialized techniques must be used in order to estimate these contributions to A mu. So these techniques include computational techniques, specifically lattice QCD, and also relating the contributions to other observables which have been measured. Now, the hadronic contributions come in two forms. The first is called hadronic vacuum polarization, and the second is hadronic light-by-light -light scattering. So in each of these two types of diagrams, there's an insertion of a blob that's marked hadrons. This blob represents the hadronic part of the diagram. Now, whether a particular diagram is called vacuum polarization or light-by-light -light scattering depends on how many photons are connected to that hadron blob. If there are two, it's called vacuum polarization, and if there are four, it's called light-by-light -light scattering. Now, the vacuum polarization tends to be a larger contribution, so the contribution to A mu from the vacuum polarization diagrams tends to be of order 10 to the minus 7, whereas for the light-by-light -light scattering, it's of order 10 to the minus 9. Now the largest source of uncertainty is from the experimental inputs that are used to calculate the contribution from the hadronic vacuum polarization diagrams. So the contribution to A mu arising from these hadronic diagrams turns out to be a bit bigger than the electroweak correction, but much, much smaller than the QED correction. And it has the largest uncertainty of the three classes of corrections. So in order to get the standard model prediction for A mu, you total up the contributions from QED, electroweak, and hadronic diagrams. And that total is given in the last line on this slide. As you can see, the value is dominated by the QED corrections, but the uncertainty is basically the same as the hadronic uncertainty. Okay, so that value predicted by the standard model currently disagrees with measurement by 3.7 sigma. And we're expecting new results from the Fermilab G-2 experiment on April 7th. Okay, so let's briefly summarize. Here we've reviewed how the standard model prediction for G-2 of the muon is obtained, and we've given its current value and its error bar. And currently, this differs from the value measured at Brookhaven by 3.7 sigma. In the next video, Possible New Physics Contributions to Muon G-2, we'll look at possible contributions to G-2 of the muon from physics beyond the standard model.